Captain Cosmos is currently available for 700 caps on the Creation Club. Astoundingly awesome tales. Gear up for a new cosmic adventure. In space, no one can hear terrible acting. Venture onto the set of the old Captain Cosmos TV show and obtain a unique weapon, outfit, and set of power armor that would make any space cadet proud. Created by Kyle Oliver Gibson, Sovereign Walrus, with additional art and support by Rob Vogel, Fading Signal. Creations obtained via quest. I, for one, am excited. Captain Cosmos has been long referred to by characters in the Fallout universe, and I'm eager to hear the full story. Will it be worth 700 credits? Let's find out. The next time we arrive in the Commonwealth, we start the Captain Cosmos quest. Find the Captain Cosmos delivery. On a side note, I really like the way Bethesda used the radio system on the Pip-Boy to integrate new DLCs. The way the Creation Club creations have worked so far is we just get an anonymous message, some new quest, but we don't have any story or lore that tells us where that message comes from. I'd love to see the start of these quests integrated into the lore of the world a little bit better. At any rate, once we get the quest, it points us towards Lexington. We find a new icon on our map between the Super Duper Mart and Mystic Pines. Upon arrival, we find a super mutant behemoth attacking raiders as typical, but to find the shipment, we head behind the Super Duper Mart. There we find a ruined truck. We see a hubris comic sign on the door of the truck, but for some reason in my game, the door had blown off, which caused the sign to look like it was floating in midair. Anyway, in the back of the truck, we see a bunch of crates and shipping containers, and one footlocker, the hubris delivery crate. Inside, we find a note, hubris delivery locations, the hubris TV studios key, some toys, a jangles the moon monkey rocket ship and toy alien, and eight new items, the Captain Cosmo's toy box. Inspecting it in our inventory, we see that it's a beautiful little cardboard box. It must have at one point contained the Captain Cosmos toy. The text on the side of the box says, includes one Captain Cosmos action figure and one cosmic blaster, recommended for children ages three and above. Jangles the Moon Monkey sold separately. Jangles the Moon Monkey was a character on the Captain Cosmos TV show. His toy was already in the world, and it's good to see his companion, Captain Cosmos, appearing as well. On the front, we see beautiful box art. The Captain Cosmos Space Station playset has arrived. Well, we got a couple of keys. No idea what these are for yet, but next we can inspect the hubris delivery locations. From Bud Walsh to Jimmy Hayes. Date, October 23rd, 2077. The very day the bombs dropped. Which explains why we find this delivery crate out in the middle of nowhere. Jimmy, here's a list of today's delivery locations for the Captain Cosmos toys. But please get over to the Hubris TV Studios at Hub 360 first. They're about to wrap up the big season finale episode and need them for the wrap party tonight. It sounds like they're going to load up the redemption machines for some sort of raffle. The receptionist said that they're using some high-tech space gear from the United States Space Administration. Ask her to let you in to get a sneak peek, but make it quick. You're on the clock. On page two, we find four delivery locations. The Hubris Television Studios at Hub 360, Hubris Comics, the General Atomics Galleria, and the WRVR Broadcast Station. So Hubris Comics had partnered with the United States Space Administration. Some sort of cross-promotion. Maybe the government was promoting their technology to children using the popular TV show. Governments have done worse, but that's great. Maybe that means we'll find some usable military equipment at the TV studio. We'll start by heading to Hub 360. Hub 360 is an unmarked location on our map. It's also in the middle of downtown Boston, right beneath a freeway swarming with gunners and between a bunch of skyscrapers swarming with super mutants. It's no easy location to get to earlier in the game. I already did a video about everything we can find in Hub 360 that you can watch here. At the time, we didn't see any Hubris Comics TV studio, but maybe that's changed. After finding Hub 360 and clearing the exterior, of super mutants and super mutant towns, we can enter through one of the two doors. Inside, we find the lobby exactly as we left it until we head towards the stairs. Behind the stairs, against the northern wall, 
is a brand new door that did not exist in the vanilla game. This door leads to Hubris Studios, and we can unlock it using the key we found in the footlocker. Before we do, I'm gonna try my hand at a porta diner Nope, still no luck. I'll get one one day. On the other side of the door, we arrive at the lobby. Doesn't look like anybody's been in here for a long time. Well, considering the door's been locked, I think you're probably right, Preston. We see toys hanging from the ceiling and terminals off to the left. We'll start by going behind the reception desk. It's then we notice something on the counter. Going back around, what is that? USSA, United States Space Administration. Looks like the government really did visit the set and started passing out flyers. Back on the other side of the terminal, we see a box filled with more of these flyers and an overdue book on the ground. There's an intercom on the side of the desk, but we can't interact with it. But we can access the nearby reception terminal. User D. Kobrick signed in. We find three intramails, the first from R. Ward, USSA Equipment Delivery from Roy Ward, the director, to Darcy Kobrick in reception, October 20th, 2077. Hey Darcy, General Tucker from the United States Air Force and a team from the United States Space Administration are going to be delivering some very special equipment for the Captain Cosmos season finale this week. Please give them production and studio floor access ID cards when they arrive and let the special effects team know they're going to be working with some technicians from the USSA. Also, please make sure the Captain Cosmo's Redemption Machine has been loaded with prizes for the wrap party. Here is a list of the delivery contents. Captain Cosmo's Cosmic Cannon, ooh. New Captain Cosmo's Space Suits and Captain Cosmo's Double Out Power Armor Sets. Sets, plural, more than one. Again, don't forget to load up the vending machine. You're the best, Roy. So we're looking for ID cards that should allow us to access a new weapon, some new power armor, and some spacesuits. In the next one, we find an entramail from R. Stoddard. Wrap party date? From Rod Stoddard, Captain Cosmos himself, to Darcy Kobrick. Reception. October 22nd, 2077, the day before the bombs dropped. Hello there, Darcy. I didn't hear back from you yet, so I wanted to ask you again, for the third time, if you'd like to be my date to the rap party tomorrow night. You'd be crazy to pass up the opportunity, but I'm sure you know that. Oh, God. By the way, I have a huge stack of these autographed Captain Cosmos posters that need to be mailed out, so if you could please come down to my dressing room to pick them up immediately, that would be spectacular. Oh, so those weren't flyers. Those were autographed posters from the actor who played Captain Cosmos. Looks like she did make it down to his dressing room, if we find a stack of the posters up here. While you're down here, I can show you my new weightlifting routine. I know, I know. It's hard to improve on all this, but apparently there are muscles called quads. <laughs> and I'll be damned if mine aren't the best in this galaxy or any other. Cosmos out! <laughs> Oh no, this guy. He's just now learning about quads? And in the final one, R. Ward, Accident on Set. From Roy Ward, the director, to Darcy Kobrick Reception. October 23rd, 2077. Darcy, there was just an accident while we were filming, and Johnny Morton is hurt pretty bad. Someone screwed up. The weapon from the USSA is using live fire ammunition. Please send out a company-wide message letting everyone know the explosions and screams they may have heard are nothing to worry about, and that we all still have our jobs to do. We can't miss this shoot deadline, so just make it look like it was no big deal, okay? Oh, what a bungle. He mentioned Johnny Morton. We already know the actor who played Captain Cosmos was Rod Stoddard, so Johnny Morton must have been an extra who got injured. I was about to say that we can only hope that he survived, but seeing as how he was injured on the very day the bombs dropped, his injury was likely the least of his concerns. Backing out of the terminal, we see a brand new orange vending machine to the right. This is a Captain Cosmos redemption machine. Redeem your Captain Cosmos toy boxes here for special prizes. So this was part of a marketing ploy, designed to sell more Captain Cosmos toys. Children who purchased a toy could redeem the boxes here for other prizes. 
we see that it works much like an overdue book return, and we find quite a few options. A mystery prize for three boxes, a Captain Cosmos poster for five boxes, a Jangles the Moon Monkey for eight boxes, a Captain Cosmos CC double lot figurine for ten boxes, a CC double lot power armor piece for fifteen boxes, a Captain Cosmos spacesuit for twenty, and a Captain Cosmos cosmic cannon also for twenty. We could buy a few of these things, after all we found eight boxes in that locker, but I have a sneaking suspicion that we'll likely find many of the prizes available here inside the studio, so we'll come back to this after we explore. To the left, next to this terminal, is a door to the Hubris Studios film set, but... Door's chained up on the other end. We find one of the Captain Cosmos posters on the wall right next to this, and he's looking good with his sidekick Jangles. Moving towards the middle of reception, we find a model stingray lying on the ground. We have found a few of these real stingrays dotting the Commonwealth. There's a mostly intact overturned one right next to Nordhagen Beach, and there's one proudly on display outside Arcjet Systems. Perhaps Arcjet had something to do with the manufacturing of the stingray. We see a Jangles the Moon Monkey on the ground and a floating toy rocket above. There are lots of options to explore. We'll start by heading through the big hole in the wall to the east, and doing so alerts a nearby Radroach. This room was a bit of an office space. We see four office desks, bedecked with terminals and telephones and whiskey and boxes, all sorts of things a pre-war office worker would need, especially the whiskey. All of the terminals are broken except one. This is the writer's terminal. The logged-in user is M. Nichols. We find four entromels. The first is from D. Kobrick. You know who is bothering me. From Darcy Kobrick, in reception, hers was the terminal we read just a moment ago, to Mary Nichols, the lead writer, on October 22nd, 2077, the very day she got that flirtatious message from the actor who plays Captain Cosmos. I really don't know how you deal with Rod every day. I'm counting down the hours until I no longer have to deal with him asking me out on a date every 10 minutes. Just because he's Captain Cosmos doesn't mean he gets to have everything he wants. He's too old for me anyway, and he always smells like that monkey he carries around all the time. He just doesn't get the hint. Only one more day until our production break. I can't wait. What are your plans? In the next one, from G. Bennett, season finale script, from Gary Bennett, writer, to Mary Nichols, lead writer, October 18th, 2077. I read your notes about your problem with the script for the finale, and I completely agree. Captain Cosmos versus the giant cockroach from Mars? Are you kidding me? A giant deadly cockroach? That doesn't seem believable at all. Why couldn't we go with Little Green Men? Or better yet, another Silver Shroud crossover? This new director is going to run the show into the ground. We should update our resumes. <laughs> well, the Little Green Men should be believable as they do exist in this universe, and a Silver Shroud crossover would be smart, considering the popularity of the local Boston radio play. The irony, of course, is that we do fight giant cockroaches of death in the post-war Fallout universe. In the next one, from R. Stoddard, regarding script changes. Hey, Mary. I was just looking over the script here, and I really don't think I have enough lines in the season finale episode. I know it's supposed to be action-packed, but what did you think of the monologues I sent over? Particularly the one titled, American Space Justice. Of course he wants a monologue. I know the director already said no, but maybe he needs to be reminded who's really in control around here. So, please just slip in my monologue, and we'll see what happens. I have no doubt everyone will be amazed. Cosmo's out. And that's the problem, buddy. You really should. And in the final one, from D. Kobrick, Emergency. From Darcy Kobrick, Reception, to everyone at Hubris Studios, October 23rd, 2077. Attention, don't panic. Is that a Hitchhiker's Guide reference? But the news has just reported multiple nuclear explosions in New York and Pennsylvania. It's not confirmed yet if this is a hoax or some sort of mistake, but we all need to do as we were trained. Get down into the studio floor basement and seal all of the doors immediately. Oh no, please don't tell me they're still there. The concrete walls are thick enough that we should all be safe. The Etotronic was just restocked too, so we should have plenty of food to hold us over until we find out what happened. Please descend in a single file line down the stairwells, and do not take the elevators. Oh great, after reading that terminal, I have a feeling we may not be alone here. 
After we finish looting the desks, we can head to the northern end where we find a bar covered in Nuka Cola. We find a lunch pail with some donut mix inside. Great if you have the Slocum's Joe creation. And there's a Nuka Cola cherry on the ground. In the back of this room to the east, we find a kitchen. And inside, the body of a scavenger. Oh, and a ghoul. <laughs> this scavenger confuses me. I thought the door has been locked. This corpse is fresh, which means the scavenger found her way in here fairly recently. I'm not sure exactly how we can explain this. After looting the fridges, we find a number of containers. There's a lunch pail with some whiskey on a countertop to the east next to a stim pack, and plenty of brain fungus on the walls. As we leave, there's a footlocker on the ground by a trash can where we find three Captain Cosmo's toy boxes. Excellent. More currency to use in the redemption machine. Heading out of the kitchen and out of the office area, we see a staircase to the north. Part of me thinks that may be where we're supposed to go, so I'm going to avoid that for now. Instead, we'll open the red door to the west, which leads back out to the lobby. To the right, we see a destroyed Protectron, and what's this? This looks a lot like the XMB booster engine that we found at ArcJet Systems, developed for the USSA's Mars Shot Project. We learned a lot about the lore behind this engine when we explored ArcJet Systems, which I did in the video that you can watch here. It's not the only one. The one at ArcJet was a prototype G12, but we do find another prototype on a flatbed that was being transported near to Fort Hagen before the bombs dropped. That was a prototype G10. But both of those are huge compared to this one, which makes me think that this must be a model. Perhaps another prop for the Captain Cosmos set. From here, we find a hallway to the north and a gift shop to the west. We'll check out the gift shop for now. We find our first Captain Cosmos Power Armor figurine, giving a thumbs up inside a display case with an American flag. We can loot these, which appear in our inventory as junk items. We have to be careful if we store these in a settlement workshop because they will get consumed for scrap. It may be better to use a mod like OC Decorator and the OC Dispenser to set them up as static decorations in our settlements. Moving into the gift shop, we can get rid of a rad roach. Well, that was a big boy. And we alert a symbol clacking monkey. Uh-oh, I heard something move off to the north. Was that Preston or something connected to this trap? Either way, we can get rid of this doggone monkey. There's nothing behind the gift shop counter. We find a few bottle caps on the counter next to the monkey and some ammo and money in the register. We see some beautiful Captain Cosmos posters on the wall behind it. Captain Cosmos in his power armor spacesuit holding up a toy box, another Captain Cosmos poster in his spacesuit, and another one in a slightly different art style. I would love these as settlement decorations. We find a few toys in the gift shop, including another Captain Cosmos power armor figurine. One more for my collection. But that's it for the gift shop, so heading out we can go down the hallway to the north. We see a door to the right completely blocked in with rubble, and to the left, we find a small storage room. More posters and filing cabinets. Oh, and a TV in the corner. Looks like people were enjoying the show while working. I'm sure that never got old. Out of this room, we find another door blocked in with rubble to the left, and to the right, we find a bit of a workshop. On the wall to the right, we see a shelf with two weapon mods, the Cosmic Cannon Pulse Barrel and the Cosmic Cannon Laser Barrel. These are very valuable, and I'll talk about them more when we talk about the Cosmic Cannon. There's a workbench here, some psycho on a nearby filing cabinet, and we find our first pre-war skeleton. The skeleton of, likely, a pre-war employee holding a snub-nosed 44 pistol. This tells us he likely committed suicide after being trapped here when the bombs dropped. I believe this is confirmed by a small spatter of blood on the wall in this room, and beneath this is a lunch pail filled with ammunition and Nuka cola Heading out and down the hallway, we see an open door to the left. This leads to a small office with just a few containers to loot. And then across the hall, we find a bar door. This was the door to the room that we accessed through a hole in the wall. At the end of this hallway, we see a junction. There's a room off to the left and then a doorway to the right. I think the doorway may be where we need to go, so we'll head left first. And here we find... <laughs> Ah! <laughs> 
that was Johnny Morton, the extra who got injured by the prop that was using live ammunition while recording the season finale. He didn't die, but he became ghoulified. On the ground next to this table, we find a skeleton in a lab coat. This must have been one of the doctors who was trying to help Johnny after his injury, but he died a long time ago. And on a nearby cart is the very weapon that injured him. Nice. We find a cryo cosmic cannon rifle. This is such a fun weapon, but we'll wait to go over it in detail after we finish exploring the studio. After looting the cannon, we find some fusion cells nearby. I'm grateful that it doesn't take a brand new ammunition. If you install Creation Club Creations, your ammunition loot tables will already be filled with Argent Plasma. On a shelf next to the stretcher, we find some surgical tools and a stim pack and a terminal, the conference terminal. User F. Marsh signed in. We find three intramails, the first from R. Ward, USSA slash Captain Cosmos promo. From Roy Ward, the director, to Frank Marsh, the producer, October 17th, 2077. I met with General Tucker like you asked. They were excited to have their new equipment featured in the season finale, and even offered to have some technicians on site during the shoot. It's going to save us a bundle on production costs. He said they need all the good press they can get after the whole incident at ArcJet with the reporter. And if this helps get the Mars Shot Project back on track, they'll buy up all of our commercial airtime. I smell a bonus in the air for both of us. Come down and have a drink with me to celebrate. This is excellent! They're tying in the lore of this set with the lore we read at ArcJet. We recall that the incident at ArcJet was actually the incineration and death of a reporter who was exploring where he didn't belong and got vaporized when ArcJet tested their rocket engine. There we learned that ArcJet had managed to keep it pretty hush-hush, but it appears that some people found out anyway, and that the news had harmed the public's impression of the United States Space Administration. In the next one, also from Roy Ward, regarding an accident, to Frank Marsh, the director, October 23rd, 2077. Frank, Rod shot Johnny with the weapon from the USSA during a scene, and it was somehow using live fire. I thought this weapon was supposed to be a prop. Call General Tucker immediately and sort this out. Heads are going to roll over this, and it better not be mine. This is going to be terrible for my career. We're supposed to wrap filming today, so we might have to get someone to take Johnny's place and edit his lines in. Carl, the delivery clerk, might work as a stand-in if we can put him in a spacesuit. What a mess! Some crew members are bringing Johnny upstairs to the conference room to wait for the paramedics. Can you please talk to him if he's conscious, and make sure he doesn't plan on suing us? Of course, he's more worried about his career than the injury of poor Johnny. The final one, Emergency, is the same company-wide email from the receptionist, notifying them about the bombs dropped on New York and Pennsylvania. So we don't need to read this again. Well, since we find two skeletons in lab coats here, it looks like the paramedics did indeed come before the bombs dropped, but then must have died in the initial blast. Heading out and moving east down the hallway, we pass the elevator. We can tag the call button, but the elevator is out of order. Interesting that they have a sign on this thing. It means it was out of order before the bombs dropped. Strange that the receptionist would tell the entire company not to use an elevator that was already out of order. Continuing down the hallway, we see a door to the left. It's locked with a novice lock. After picking it, we find a storage room, and inside we find another hubris delivery crate with five more Captain Cosmos toy boxes. There are two tool cases here with minor loot and a first aid kit, and it's interesting that we see two unrusted tin cans and an unused enamel bucket. I guess they haven't been tarnished by time because they've been locked in this room for 200 years. Strange, though, that we find rust and trash on all of the other shelves. With that, we've fully explored this level, and we see a staircase leading downstairs to the east. The light is red, which means they're still filming? There was one thing we missed, however. It's clear now that we need to go downstairs. But there was that staircase in the office room next to the kitchen that led upstairs. I wanted to find out what was there. Heading back to the lobby, we see one door we missed in the western wall. This just leads to the bathroom. Here we find a first aid kit on the wall and a skeleton by the urinals. This poor fellow died while he was taking care of business. One stall is empty and the other has a female skeleton in it? Wait a minute, are we in the men's restroom or the women's? I saw the urinals on the wall. What was a woman doing in this stall? Maybe some employees had just finished some extracurricular activities in the privacy of this bathroom. Heading across the lobby to the offices, we can take the stairway to the north to the top floor where we find a ghoul. <laughs> I 
I realized halfway through that that I was using an irradiated sword that caused radiation damage, which heals ghouls. Probably not the best weapon. But we see that the staircase is blocked off with rubble. All we find for our efforts is a glowing Nuka-Cola Quantum hiding behind a filing cabinet. And with that, we finish exploring the main floor and this top stairwell. This leaves only one place left to explore. We need to head back to that hallway and head down the staircase to the east. At the very bottom, we find a door to the Hubris Studios production offices. Inside, we arrive in a hallway and we see a sign on the wall to the left. Hubris. Comics and Toys. Moving down the corridor, we see the elevator blocked up with furniture. Wonder why they blocked this up if it was out of order. And we arrive in a large, lounge-like area. Directly to the right, we find a bathroom. And on the ground is another dead scavenger. How did she get all the way down here through the locked door? Well, we don't have long to think about it. Opening the stalls, we see that they're empty, but one has a nasty decal on the ground. Looks like something horrendous happened here. Ooh. Out of the bathroom and into the large room, we see a door to the right with a flickering on the air sign. This must be where we're supposed to go, but it's locked, and we can't activate the intercom. We see a card swipe to the left, which means we need to look out for those key cards that we read about earlier. Moving forward, we find a novice locked door to the right. This leads to a bit of a mixing room. We find blasted out terminals and desk to the right, a mixing station in front of a window to the left, and that leads to a sound recording booth. Heading inside, look at this. So this is where they dubbed the Captain Cosmos TV show. We see all sorts of sound baffles on the walls, and on a mobile cart, a bunch of empty liquor bottles and one whiskey. We'll call this creative fuel. There is one skeleton on the ground, no indication who this might be, and through a hole in the wall, we can enter another room. When the ghoul is dead, we can explore the desks and terminals and tables laid out. They're all in a state of ruin. And to the south, we find a film set access terminal, locked with a novice lock. After hacking it, we find one option, studio door control interface, override the studio door lock. Upon clicking it and backing out, I don't know a thing about these old computers. We don't hear anything, but I think we know what this did. It likely opened the security door that had the big on the air sign over it. So there are two ways to open the door, to use the key cards, which we haven't found yet, or to hack this terminal. Backing out of this room, we see a hallway to the south and one to the east. We'll start by going south, where we see something on the wall. There's a little coffee nook in this room. We can walk away with some coffee tins for our Slocum's Joe shops and another Captain Cosmo's toy box. Heading into the kitchen at the far southern end, we immediately get attacked from behind. Whoa! Ooh, that was a big fellow. Oh. The little ones are all right, but these big ones are nasty. Here we find an Etotronic on the wall. We remember reading in the receptionist's intra mail that these had recently been stocked full of food. But all we find here are two moldy plates, which tells us that the people who fled here likely ate through most of the food before succumbing to the fallout. We find one lunch pail on a shelf to the west, a cooler next to the kitchen sink, and then a human torso on the ground next to a bowler hat. And it's here where we find our first key card. But we don't need this anymore, as we already opened the door using the terminal. After looting the fridges and the rest of the containers here, we can back on out. It's then when we notice the skeleton of a uniformed serviceman on the ground in the rubble. So the military was here when the bombs dropped, likely watching over the use of the gear that they allowed the film set to borrow. Moving to the east, we see a door-lined hallway. Starting with the door to the left, we find a small office with booze on a nearby cabinet, more disgusting splatter on a nearby wall, Ew. We find a second Hubris TV Studio ID card on a desk here, right next to a director's terminal. I see, so this must have been Roy Ward's terminal. Sure enough, inside we see user Roy Ward signed in. There are three intramails here, the first from Darcy Kobrick, the receptionist, October 21st, 2077. Mr. Ward, General Tucker and his team from the USSA are here with the equipment. I've given them production and studio access cards like you asked, and they're on their way down to the production offices to meet with you now. I also refilled the redemption machines. Here's the list of the equipment and the delivery. And then we see a list of some of the gear we already read about. We've already found the Captain Cosmo's Cosmic Cannon, but we have yet to find the spacesuit and the power armor. This raises a question, though. They've got military-grade equipment in the Redemption Terminal, and to get it, you have to turn in a toy box. First, isn't it strange to be giving military gear to children? 
And second, aren't the toys cheaper than power armor and weapons? So you'd think they'd be losing money on the deal, even if it's 20 boxes for a gun. But anyway, backing out of this one, we find an entry from Captain Cosmos himself, Dressing Rooms. From Rod Stoddard, Captain Cosmos, to Roy Ward, the director, October 21st, 2077. Roy, we're both professionals, and I think we can agree that I'm the true star of Captain Cosmos, so why did Jangles get a bigger dressing room than me? I like monkeys as much as the next guy, but I think his trainer was pulling your leg when he said Jangles needed a bigger room for all that jungle gym equipment. My strict calisthenics regimen demands that I have ample space to maneuver. Plus, I'm running out of wall area for all my mirrors and fan letters. Can we discuss this? Cosmos out. Gosh, the quickest way to get fired as an aging actor is to become a fussy aging actor. The final one is the company-wide email from the receptionist. Next to this is a safe and it's thankfully unlocked. We can loot a bunch of ammunition. With this room explored, we can back out to the hallway and open the door to the right. This leads to a bit of a theater, and it's occupied with two moviegoers. With the ghouls dead, we can loot the containers up here. Heading downstairs, we find empty booze bottles and another Hubris TV Studios ID card on a nearby shelf. There's one whiskey on the ground in the corner, and that's really all there is in this room. Heading out of this room and turning right, we see another footlocker on the ground with four more Captain Cosmos toy boxes. And at last, we can open the door at the eastern end of the hallway. This leads to a utility room where we find a mailbox, a first aid kit on the wall, and Captain Cosmos spacesuit. This unique legendary item increases jump height and prevents falling damage. This is such a fun costume, but I'm going to wait until after we explore this place to delve into it in detail. We find a few more containers to loot, but with that, we've explored everything. Now, we need to retrace our steps and head through the security door that we opened via the terminal. The on-the-air light is still flickering red, turning off our light and going down the stairs. With the ghoul dead at the bottom, we find a door to the Hubris Studios film set. On the other side of the door, we arrive in a huge TV set. We see the set on the far end of this room, and surrounding us on either side are doors and shelves and crates and boxes. Where to even begin? While heading down the stairs, we find ourselves on the eastern side of this room. After looting some nearby lockers, we can start by heading to this big cement room in the middle of the room. Opening the big double doors leads to a bit of a storage room. Here we find a CC double dot module prop. This appears to have no practical function and just looks like a fun movie prop. It appears in the junk section of our inventory, but I'm sure we could turn it into a settlement decoration using the OC dispenser. After looting it, I heard a ghoul, but he doesn't appear to be nearby. He may be on top of this box. <laughs> nope! <laughs> No matter how long I play this game, the ghouls continue to surprise me. After killing the ghoul, we can start to loot. There's another hubris delivery crate on the bottom of this shelf, where we find four more toy boxes. And nearby, we find another CC double dot piece prop. This one, however, looks like a prop of some power armor. We find ammo and grenades in a wooden crate, some ammo in a footlocker, and that's about it for this room. Heading out, we can climb the stairs to the top of this room, where indeed we find a feral ghoul. Here we see the skeleton of a man splayed out next to a cooler and a lunch pail. But that's really all there is up here. So after looting the last few containers, we can head back downstairs. Turning right. Oh, oh Preston, how did he get in there? Well, the security gate wasn't locked. Oh, and we see another one on the other side. That's how we got in. Heading inside, we see more mixing stations looking out windows facing the set. We can loot another Captain Cosmos power armor figurine, but that's all we find in this room. Coming out the other end leads to three more storage shelves, where we can loot another wooden crate and one more hubris delivery crate, where we get one more Captain Cosmos toy box. Heading north, we see a cooler on some crates, and then turning around, we see a novice locked door to the right, and there's a bloody handprint just outside. There's also green ghoul juice on the ground in front of the door and on the wall next to it. After picking it, we find three ghouls. One of which is named 
Roy Baker. I think this may have been a mistake. His name is Roy Baker, but the only Roy we find on any of the terminals is Roy Ward, the director. In fact, we don't find anyone named Baker on any of the terminals. So I believe this must be a bug. This must have been the ghoul of Roy Ward, the director. They just got his last name wrong. Inside this room, we find two other unnamed ghouls and the skeleton of a woman. I get the impression, based on the bloody handprint outside and the ghoul ooze all over the wall, that people began to ghoulify quickly while locked in this basement. Roy and a few of the other survivors locked themselves in this room to avoid being killed by a glowing one, only for many of them to turn ghoul themselves. Inside this room, we find a lot of brain fungus on the walls and an end of dungeon steamer trunk with a huge selection of ammunition and explosives. Looking up, however, we see a hole in the roof and a familiar figure peering at us. Is that the Captain Cosmo's power armor suit? But how do we get up there? We can't jump through these boards. Well, we can finish looting this room first. After looting more brain fungus and discovering many more human skeletons, while well, this really was where the survivors sought shelter. We can loot another delivery crate in the corner with five more Captain Cosmo's toy boxes and then read the production terminal on the wall to the east. Here we find six new entries. Captain Cosmo's production log. In the first one, new equipment, October 20th, 2077. It sounds like the Air Force or Space Administration is going to be doing a cross promotion with the show to try and get some good PR around their Mars shot project. After all their screw ups, they need all the help they can get. They're also going to send some technicians to work with us on the shoot. They'd better not get in the way. We run a tight ship around here. In the next one, shoot status, October 22nd, 2077. Things are going pretty good so far, and we are on schedule to wrap shooting the season finale. Although these technicians the USSA sent over are starstruck. They spend more time chatting up Captain Cosmos and playing with Jangles than they do with safety training. We only have two days left to shoot and haven't even gone over the weapon prop they brought in. Ah, so this explains why the production team didn't discover that the weapon was armed with live ammunition. The servicemen here were too busy rubbing shoulders with celebrities to give the production team a rundown. In the next one, Injury on Set, October 23rd, 2077. I can't believe it. The weapon the USSA delivered to us wasn't a prop. It was a live weapon. Our guest star Johnny Morton was wounded pretty bad during one of the fight scenes a few minutes ago. People are freaking out, and they're taking him upstairs to wait for the paramedics. We were told to put Carl into a spacesuit and try to shoot the rest of Johnny's scenes with him as a stand-in. Yikes. In the next one, Nuclear War, October 23rd, 2077, we just heard over the loudspeaker that the facility is going on lockdown because there are reports of nuclear detonations across the country. Everyone is scrambling to get down here and seal up the doors. Can this day get any worse? Indeed it can. As we learn in the next one, it's all over. But the crying. October 28th, 2077. Well, that was it. The end of the world. Everything is gone. We've been locked down here for five days and have already run out of food. I don't know what we're going to do now. All radio signals went dead a couple of hours after we got down here. Everyone is starting to get sick too. I think the air ventilation system might not have been sealed off properly. All we can do is cover up the vents and hope for the best. I feel sick. I'm gonna go lie down. You know, it's possible that the unnamed production worker who filled out these entries was named Roy Baker. But he's not named here, and it is coincidental that he shares the same first name as the set's director. At the very end, we find an option to override the door lock. After tagging it, we don't hear anything, so we're not sure where that door was. But my bet is that it was above us. Heading out, we see a catwalk above us, but the catwalk stairs are broken. Easy enough to get up there if we have a jetpack, but if we don't, we can climb this broken ramp. And if we time it just right, leap across. Here, we open a door to find the skeleton of a woman on the ground, a man draped over a nearby mattress, and a full suit of USSA CC double ot power armor. This is the suit of power armor the military developed that they brought to the set of Captain Cosmos, and it is a functional set of power armor. We can hop on in if we have a fusion core. We find a fusion core in a generator nearby, in case we didn't come with any of our own. There's another end of dungeon steamer trunk up here with plenty of ammunition and explosives. And after looting a few more final minor containers, we can head back down to the ground floor. 
Well, we've got our main prize, but there are a few more places left to explore. We'll start by moving to the eastern side of this room. Here we see a door to a kitchen, or a cafeteria, where we find a rad roach. We can loot some Nuka-Cola from a nearby machine, an Edotronic that is mostly empty, only a few pieces of moldy food inside, an empty first aid kit on the wall, and a cooler. That's about it for the cafeteria. Heading out and turning left, we find a door with a star on it for Jangles the Moon Monkey. So this was Jangle's changing room that made the actor who played Captain Cosmos so jealous. Well, let's see what the talk was all about. Heading inside, we see that it is indeed large. On a coffee table to the left, we see blocks spelling the word Jangles. I wonder if the monkey did this himself. If so, that's pretty smart. There's a jungle gym in here and some monkey bars. Lots of exercise equipment as we read. And in the middle of the room, we find a doll. Jangles the moon monkey, not a real one. I got the impression that Jangles was a real monkey. After all, the receptionist said that Captain Cosmos constantly smelled like monkey, but we don't find a monkey skeleton here, or a ghoulified monkey, and we do find this Jangles. Could it be that this entire room was just for a prop monkey? We see a few minor containers and lunch boxes we can loot, a suitcase under a nearby bed, and that's it for Jangles' room. Heading out, we can move towards the set. Here we find some power armor, but then... Rod Stoddard! This was Captain Cosmos. He didn't die with the bombs, he turned into a glowing one. It may have been his glowing one slime all over the door to the production room. Fitting that he was lying all this time in rubble near to his Captain Cosmos suit of power armor. Well, it's a good thing we brought Preston with us. I definitely want to take this home. We can tell him to hop on in it. Okay. And we walk away with two suits of USSA CC Double Ot Power Armor. Behind the backdrop, we find a CC Double Ot Module Prop and another CC Double Ot Piece Prop, which again just appear in our junk section. The last thing we need to explore is what's at the top of the staircase to the east. Heading up the stairs, the first room on the right is the dressing room of Captain Cosmos himself, Rod Stoddard. Inside we see that, yeah, it is smaller than Jangle's, but it's still nice and spacious. Not sure why he was getting so upset. We can loot another action figure, and we find Captain Cosmos Terminal. User logged in, R. Stoddard. To R. Ward, regarding the dressing room, we can read the director's response to his jealous email. From Roy Ward Director to Rod Stoddard, Captain Cosmos, October 21st, 2077. Re, why did Jangles get a bigger dressing room than me? Rod, we talked about this twice already. You know Jangles is happier when he has his jungle gym nearby. I know you're the star of the show, but everyone really loves the monkey. If the Captain Cosmos playsets start to outsell the Jangles toys, we can talk again. It appears that they never did. We find Jangles the Moon Monkey toys all over the Commonwealth, but never any Captain Cosmos toys. Though I should mention that with this creation installed, the Captain Cosmos toy boxes are added to loot tables, so we will start to find them in containers spread around the Commonwealth. In the next one, from B. Hughes regarding auditions, from Brian Hughes, agent, to Rod Stoddard, Captain Cosmos, October 22nd, 2077. Re. These working conditions are getting out of hand. Have we had any calls back for my theater auditions? Rod, I understand that you are, as you worded it, a very gifted thespian with talent beyond compare, but I think you should work out your differences with the director and stick it out. This TV show is still a huge hit, and it puts your name on the map. Besides, is it really so bad working with Jangles? I love that little monkey. <laughs> that line alone probably infuriated Rod. And the final one is just the company-wide message from the receptionist about the nuclear apocalypse. Here we can explore his room. On a suitcase, we find a dirty black suit and a red dress right in front of a mirror. Um, I guess this means Rod enjoyed cross-dressing. Hey, man, you do you, Rod. You do you. Nearby, we find a wet bar filled with all sorts of alcoholic beverages. We can walk away with two whiskeys. There's a wall safe nearby, filled with ammunition, quite a little stash, and then on the ground, next to two overturned mannequins, we find another Captain Cosmos spacesuit. Sweet, we're walking away with enough Captain Cosmos gear to arm ourselves and one companion with a spacesuit and a power armor suit each. Now we just need to find another weapon for our companion. There's not much else here in the room, so heading out we can turn right, where we find 
the dressing room of Jane Faraday, Stella Skyfire. We remember Stella Skyfire being referenced by Sally, the little girl whom we met on Mothership Zeta from Fallout 3. She loved the Captain Cosmos TV show so much that she referred to it often during the entire DLC, and at the very end when we invaded the bridge, she pretended that she was Stella Skyfire. Wow! This looks just like the bridge on Captain Cosmos! I know what to do. Soma, you go stand over there. Mr. Elliot, you're there. Paulson, you can be Jangles the Moon Monkey, and I get to aim the Death Ray! <laughs> I ain't no goddamn space monkey. Stella Skyfire reporting for duty. She's Captain Cosmo's second in command, at least for the first few episodes. Opening the door to her dressing room, we see that it's about the same size as Rod's. There are a few dresses lying around, a teddy bear hiding under a couch, oh, and a rad roach. We find a selection of chems on a cabinet to the east. Looks like this starlet liked to shoot up for the cameras. And then on a desk nearby, we find a power fist with a heating coil power fist mod. <clears throat> well, I can't think of any reason why she would have this. Moving on, that's about it for her dressing room. Heading out, we can view one final glimpse of the Martian surface Captain Cosmo's TV set and bid farewell to pre-war America's favorite TV show. To leave, we head to the Southwest where we can open a big double doors to the exit that we can unlock with the Hubris TV Studios key. We find a staircase leading upstairs, and as we explore this bottom section, we awaken some ghouls up there. With the ghouls dead, we can scale to the top, where we find a door that leads to an exit, where we can loot a first aid kit and remove the chains on that chained door that we found in the TV studio lobby. This puts us back in the lobby, right next to the Captain Cosmo's Redemption Terminal. We have a whole lot of boxes now. After exploring the whole place, I walked away with 31 of them. We can activate the machine to purchase another Captain Cosmo's Cosmic Cannon for 20 boxes. And we've got our second gun. Now we can arm our companion. Now we recall, in the note that we found in the Hubris Comics trunk, that deliveries were made to three other spots. The first is Hubris Comics itself, right next to Swan's Pond. Heading that way, we find a redemption terminal just outside. Inside the redemption terminal, we find all the same options that we found at the last one. And they're all the same prices. I wanted to see what some of these were, so purchasing a mystery prize disappointingly gave me an undamaged camera. Trying it again disappointingly gave me a damaged camera. So the mystery prize isn't really worth it. Don't bother exploring Hubris Comics. I don't think any changes were made here. I turned the entire place upside down and I didn't find any more boxes. Next, we can head to the WRVR radio station. This place is involved in the quest involving Strong from Trinity Tower. I covered it in my video, The Milk of Human Kindness, that you can watch here. And just outside, we find another redemption terminal. But this one has four Captain Cosmos toy boxes on the ground. However, inside, we find all of the same options. I went inside the studio, but I didn't find any other boxes. To find the last redemption terminal, we can head to the General Atomics Galleria. We find it against the wall of Back Alley Bowling, but sadly we don't find any boxes outside. The contents of the terminal are exactly the same as the other three. While we're here, we can see what these posters are for five credits. Upon purchasing one, we see that we get a Captain Cosmos poster number two, and we see a message that we've unlocked new posters that we can build in the settlement workshop. Trying again, I got poster number four. So it looks like every time we buy one of these posters for five boxes, a random one gets placed in our inventory. If we have 15 boxes, we can purchase another CC double dot power armor piece. And like with the posters, if we purchase this item, a random power armor piece is added to our inventory. The first time I tried it, I got the torso with the jetpack mod attached, and the second time I got a new helmet. So it looks like we can build for ourselves a third and even fourth suit of the Captain Cosmo's power armor, but each piece is generated randomly, so it may take a while and consume a whole lot of boxes. Checking out the settlement build menu, we see that Captain Cosmo's does not appear as a new section in the Creation Club menu. Instead, we find the posters by navigating to decorations, wall decorations, and then posters. Here we see the new posters. Number two looks like this. Number four looks like this. 
and we only unlock the ones that we happen to randomly get from the Redemption Terminal. There are four new posters in total. This is what number one looks like, a picture of the power armor suit. This is what number three looks like, it's the same thing only Captain Cosmos is holding, the toy box. Back at the shop, we can go over the spoils. We'll start with the power armor. We see that each piece has six possible upgrades, and that the suit as we find it has already been fully upgraded to Model F. Taking a look at the stats, we see that when fully upgraded to version F, the total ballistic damage resistance for the suit is 1,580. This makes it a pretty decent suit of power armor, but not the best in the game. This incidentally is the same amount of ballistic damage resistance as a fully upgraded suit of T-60 power armor. So the Captain Cosmos suit is comparable to T-60. By comparison, a fully upgraded Mark VI version of the Enclave Hellfire power armor from the Creation Club has a total total ballistic damage resistance of 1,820, which is the same amount as a fully upgraded suit of X-01. So the Hellfire is comparable to the X-01. The Captain Cosmo suit has a total 1,245 energy resistance, which is the exact same amount as a T-60 suit, and a total 1,050 radiation resistance, which also is identical to a fully upgraded T-60 suit. The chest piece also grants plus one to action points. It has many of the same mods as a T-60 suit of armor. The chest piece comes with the jetpack mod installed, which not only gives us a jetpack, but also increases action point refresh speed, which is a unique feature of the jetpack mod just for this suit of power armor. And we also find a Tesla coils mod, which deals energy damage to nearby enemies. This mod also updates the chest piece graphically. We find a new circular device on the chest attached to electrified bars that go up to the shoulders. It has a few other unique mods. Taking a look at the helmet, we find a new Space Cowboy mod, which increases reload speed. This requires rank one of the Gunslinger perk to purchase, and this also updates the helmet graphically. This mod places a Minuteman hat on the Power Armor helmet. The one you see here has a Minuteman logo on it because I have a mod installed that reskins my Minuteman hats, but yours will look like the default Miniman hat in your game. Also, the Recon Sensors mod updates the helmet visually. It places a sensor or targeting monocle over the visor, which is a wonderful little touch. The final new mods that are unique to this suit are for the left and right arms. Here we find Tesla Bracers. Much like the Tesla Power Armor from Automatron, these add energy damage to unarmed attacks. This mod updates the arm pieces graphically, placing Tesla doodads on the shoulders. But where it really distinguishes itself is that it has way more power armor paint schemes, some of which are completely unique to the Captain Cosmos suit of power armor. I'll go through them one by one. All of them share many of the same features, including on the back by the Fusion Core valve, we find a sticker that says turn valve to enter. And I love the retro futuristic details on this thing, including the little radio antenna on the helmet and the glowing coils on the jetpack. The first suit of power armor paint is the USSA paint, which comes standard with this suit, and it grants no additional bonus. The other is the ArcJet paint scheme, which when all pieces are painted, grants a charisma bonus. These are gorgeous paint schemes, and I love the fact that they gave us an ArcJet paint scheme, which of course makes sense within the lore that they presented, as ArcJet Systems worked closely with the USSA on the Mars Shot Project, and likely on this suit of power armor. The Captain Cosmo's default paint scheme is a beautiful space white with orange accents, and the ArcJet is a bright purple with dark red accents. On the Cosmo suit, we find a Captain Cosmo's badge over the right breast, and on the ArcJet suit, we find the ArcJet Systems logo on the chest. Notice the detail on here. The ports on the front are encased in rust, and we find rust on the edges of the helmet, as we would expect if this thing had been sitting in a murky basement for 200 years. Next, there's a Repcon theme, which increases charisma when all pieces are painted, and this suit is compatible with all Hot Rod themes, including the Shark theme, which increases agility. I'm so stoked that they included a Repcon theme. Fans of Fallout New Vegas recognize Repcon as the rocket building company that we found in the Mojave Wasteland. This is the company that was acquired by Robco Industries during a hostile takeover. For the full story about the Repcon company, check out my video where we explored their 
headquarters, which you can watch here. Seeing as how Repcon was involved in space flight, possibly even working with ArcJet Systems, it makes sense that they'd have their own paint scheme. So a nice touch there. And it's a beautiful teal and yellow scheme. The Shark Hot Rod paint scheme is is pretty brilliant. It's pea green with orange accents, and I love the placement of the shark eyes on the shoulders there. <laughs> it just looks great. Hot Rod Flames increases agility when all pieces are painted, as does Hot Rod Pink, and they look exactly as we would expect, making them fit right in alongside all of the others. The suit has a unique chrome paint scheme. The chrome scheme increases perception, and it has faction paint schemes, including an enclave scheme and the Enclave scheme increases strength. The chrome is beautiful, it looks recently burnished, and I love the color combination for the Enclave, a matte black and light gray. The chrome scheme comes with orange accents and a bright reflection, and the Enclave paint scheme has the Enclave symbol right on the chest. And of course, it has other faction paint schemes, including a Minuteman scheme, which increases charisma, and a Brotherhood scheme, which increases strength. The Minuteman scheme is a sea gray blue with light gray accents and the Minuteman logo on the breast. And the Brotherhood of Steel scheme is really attractive with a matte gunmetal dark gray and bright orange accents with the Brotherhood of Steel logo on the front. The Brotherhood scheme also has Brotherhood of Steel Paladin insignia on the shoulders. I'm not sure why it stops just at Paladin. I inspected this on a character who was a Sentinel, but we don't find the Sentinel scheme in the build menu. As an option. We also don't find Initiate or Knight. And the final two paint schemes are Institute, which gives us an intelligence bonus, and Railroad, which gives us a perception bonus. These are just as beautiful as all the others. The Institute comes in their traditional off-white and bright orange, with the Institute logo on the chest, and the Railroad is a matte black, with the Railroad logo on the chest. It also has the Danger Rail sign on the shoulders, which of course makes sense because the railroad agent wearing this suit is likely dangerous. These are wonderful touches, and the suit itself is gorgeous. I particularly love the way they did the jetpack. It looks really retro-futuristic and big and clunky. Exactly what I want to see. Next, let's take a look at the unique weapon. We can modify the cosmic cannon in a workbench and we see it has many of the same mods available to laser weapons. It comes equipped with a standard capacitor. We can dramatically increase its damage by fully upgrading it to the overcharged capacitor. Then it comes with three barrel options. Strangely enough, the type of damage this weapon does is dictated by our barrel choice. It has a cryo barrel, which fires a stream of freezing mist, a laser barrel, which fires an accurate laser shot, so I guess that's for if we wanted to turn this into to a sniper rifle, and a sonic pulse barrel, which fires an energy wave that pushes back enemies, but it has a reduced rate of fire. We'll explore all three of these in just a minute. It comes with the full stock, but we could turn it into a pistol, giving it a standard grip, or fully upgrade it to a wood stock which seems a bit out of place. The wooden stock doesn't really fit with the plastic and metal theme of the gun, but the stats are great, so I'm going to upgrade this to the wooden stock. Next, we can choose sights, but we only have two options, the standard sight it comes with or a reflex sight. So I guess we can't turn this into a sniper rifle. It doesn't support scopes, it only supports iron sights. Finally, it comes with a wide array of paint schemes. The paint scheme doesn't work on the full wood stock, so I'm gonna switch it back to the full stock for this demonstration. The standard paint scheme is the USSA one, which is white with orange accents. Note the color of the wires. The wires change with each paint scheme. Sometimes the only difference between the schemes are the color of the wires. In this case, we've got bright red, blue, and yellow. Next is the ArcJet scheme, which is a vibrant purple with yellow and red cables. Then there's a Brotherhood paint scheme, which turns the whole thing dark gray with bright orange-red accents. The chrome paint scheme is slightly different with a shiny chrome finish. The wires are painted dark gray and red. Then there's the Enclave version, which darkens the gun even more, and the wires this time are red and yellow. Hot Rod Flames, which looks exactly as we would expect, red with black fire. Hot Rod Pink, pink with white spikes, and the cables at the front are white too. Hot Rod Shark, 
<laughs> I love these eyes at the front of the gun with a pea green color scheme. Institute, which is bright white and orange. They even painted most of the cabling white and orange. Minutemen, which is almost a purplish color, but it looks like a sea gray blue with blue, teal, and bronze cabling. Railroad, where everything is black, even all of the cords are black. And Repcon, which is a beautiful teal and yellow with the Repcon logo on there. We'll test out the cryo barrel first. I used console commands to bring in a super mutant. Oh, where are your guts? Ho ho ho! And it was devastating. Well, that was a bit too quick, so this time I brought in a legendary super mutant warlord, and then it became challenging. Still, I was able to whittle him down slowly over time with a fierce blast of cryo energy. I tried this setting out in the wild, and raiders melt like butter before this thing. Really, the legendary super mutant warlord was the only enemy that I had a challenge whittling down with this weapon. Everything else died almost instantly. Next, we'll try the laser barrel. We'll summon a super mutant warlord to test this. And it shoots a bright teal blue laser. It's semi-automatic, not fully automatic, which I was disappointed about for my Institute character, who's specced into Commando, but as a semi-automatic weapon, it's incredibly fast. We can pepper an enemy with dozens of blasts, and it's got a big clip of 30. And finally, we'll try the Sonic Pulse Barrel, and again summon a Warlord to test this. <laughs> I seem to hurt myself more than this Warlord. This really is not for up close and personal battle. If you stand too close to the enemy when blasting him, you can cripple your own limbs. The primary benefit of this setting, I think, is that the Sonic Blast interrupts the enemy for a bit. You can't quite get him into a stun lock, but almost. However, we have to be careful of collateral damage. In this example, a bunch of my companions came by to help, but this sonic blast radius was so large that I kept on knocking them down. I tried it again, far away from my settlement, and it's a pretty powerful weapon. And we can put it on a display rack, which is saying something because not even the Thirst Zapper works with the Contraptions Workshop weapon display racks. So this was really thoughtful of the authors. All in all, it's a pretty fun gun. I have to say that I'm a little disappointed that a semi-automatic weapon that you can configure to have a wooden marksman stock doesn't have a scope. And I wish that it did have a fully automatic laser option. And lastly, there's the Captain Cosmo spacesuit. It's a beautiful spacesuit and when we get it, it's bright orange with yellow and blue shoulder pads. There's a Captain Cosmos logo on the belt, and it comes with brown boots. And I love the texture of the spacesuit. It almost has a leathery texture. And you'll be pleased to know that, yes, it can be upgraded with Ballistic Weave. It comes with 750 radiation resistance, but without Ballistic Weave, it has zero energy or ballistic resistance. But with Ballistic Weave, we can upgrade it all the way to Mark V. 110 Ballistic and 110 Energy. We can also use an armor workbench to upgrade the boots. There are three versions of the boots, Mark 1, 2, and 3. The default is Mark 1, and this is what it looks like jumping with Mark 1 installed. Heading back to the workbench, we can upgrade it to Moon Boots Mark 2, and this is what it looks like with Mark 2 installed. Oh. 
I think that's higher. My character was falling slightly to the ground while jumping with the Mark II installed, which she didn't do with Mark I installed. And then heading back to the armor workbench, we can upgrade the Moon Boots to Mark III. And this is what Mark III looks like. And each time she hit the ground, she had to land on her hands. So I do think it is slightly higher than the Mark II. Wearing the suit does completely prevent falling damage, just like a piece of leg armor with the Acrobat legendary effect or the Freefall legs that we find in the Mass Fusion building. I took the suit out for a spin. This is with the Mark III Moon Boots. <laughs> and yeah, it's a lot of fun. You can jump pretty high and pretty far. You can jump so high that you can almost leap atop the big marble blocks that make up Hugo's hole. I couldn't quite get there, but leaping atop a forklift, I was able to jump on top of him with no jetpack needed. And finally, this beautiful suit comes in a myriad of colors. Sadly, you can't wear armor on top of it, though you can wear a helmet. The suit comes in blue, which is light blue with dark blue accents, and then yellow and blue on the collar, shoulders, and belt. It keeps the dark brown leather boots. There's green, which is a bright lime green with a darker green accent, with yellow and blue shoulder pads and belt. Pink, a light pink primary color and then a darker, almost violet pink color for the accents. Same blue and gold for the belt and shoulders. And finally red, with light red and dark red and the same blue and gold on the shoulders and belt. Notice the cuff on the left hand is correctly underneath the Pip-Boy. It's not completely missing from the outfit, it's there and it only slightly peeks out, which is wonderful attention to detail. I only wish that it came with a space helmet, like the big bulbous glass ones depicted in the poster. But then again, I suppose a big glass helmet like that would have a hard time fitting inside a suit of power armor. Okay. And that is the complete Captain Cosmo's creation, now available on the Creation Club. This is a true return to form for the Creation Club. The quality here is astounding. We get new places to explore that are full of wonderful rich lore and amazing gear. I love how they did such a great job of weaving the lore from this creation into other lore that we find in the game. Mm. Tying in Captain Cosmos with both Arcjet Systems in Boston and Repcon in the Mojave Wasteland. Is it lore friendly? I think so, it's definitely lore friendly. The authors took great aims to make it lore-friendly, and the story told in the terminals is interesting and compelling. Is it canon? Well, we don't know. Only Bethesda can decide if this is canon or not, but in my opinion, it's lore-friendly enough to be canon. I don't believe it conflicts with any established lore, and it certainly feels in place with the world. Yes, there are a few minor mistakes, like the name of the director, Ghoul, finding the scavenger corpses, and a few minor things like that. But honestly, mistakes like that are found in Fallout 4 proper, and in my opinion, they're not large enough to disqualify the creation. So, the big question, is it worth it? 700 credits? Yes, absolutely. In my opinion, it's totally worth it. But that's gonna change from person to person. What I value may not be what you value, and that's okay. But for me, it was totally worth it. But what are your thoughts? Do you, like I, believe that this is a return to form for the Creation Club? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I publish many videos every single week here on my channel, and this latest update for the Creation Club is chocked full of goodies. This was only one of three major updates, so I'm gonna make sure to cover the other two in upcoming videos. If you wanna make sure you don't miss those videos, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. Yes, I realize I'm right in the middle of a series on Nuka World. I hated to interrupt it, but Bethesda doesn't give me warning when they're about to do a big release for the Creation Club, and I have to cover it. Never fear, we'll get back to the lore of Nuka World, right where we left off in just a few days. I have a shirt shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on t-shirts in a wide variety of both men's and women's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. They also come on other items, smartphone cases, mugs, pillows, posters, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do, and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a fantastic Saturday, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video. Uh.